now. Let's just see, wait for YouTube to do its thing. It's doing something. Is it doing its thing? It's connected. Yes, we are live. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 75 of Aid Thompson and Other Disappointments. My guest tonight is a seasoned vet of the Edinburgh Fringe and a finalist of Brighton Fringe Comedy Awards and the winner of the Brighton Fringe Stand-Up Comedy Award 2015 and a passionate advocate of train beers, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. If you're unfamiliar with the wonder that is train beers, let myself and my guest tonight uh, uh, educate you on this. Um, please welcome my guest, James Benison. Woo! Hi! <laughs> what a warm welcome. I'm so glad to be here with you on your Diamond Jubilee. Yes, yeah. So we were just saying before we started streaming that it, it's episode 75, so it's my Diamond Jubilee, and James is Big the f first person to point that out, and that's really nice of you, mate. And possibly the last. <laughs> well. You can say. What, at my last Jubilee or like last episode? The last person who'll, who'll mention it. Oh, I see. I thought you meant like, yeah, it could easily be like the last episode of this podcast. I could get hit by a bus tomorrow. Uh, I, it, or, or maybe I or you will say something so offensive that we get cancelled. I hear that cancel culture is fucking rife. It's all the rage at the moment. Yes. Uh, I love cancelling things. How have you been, mate? Um, I, I could give like a little bit of a bio if you like. I, I guess what I'll do, I'll, I'll explain how we know each other. Um, sure. And then I'll hand over to you and you can you can uh, join the dots a little bit if you like. So Absolutely. So for the, for the benefit of uh, listeners who may not be uh, familiar with the wonder that is James fucking Benison. Um, James and I... I didn't used... know you had a middle name. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm pretty hot on the old research ahead of well these episodes. Um, so James and I used to do stand-up uh, in, in a variety of different um, uh, venues in and around London. Um, I uh, appeared, at, I think you did a gig somewhere. I remember you were emceeing or hosting and organising it and stuff. And I did the gig there, but there was, an, I think there was an audience about 10 or 15 people. And I remember pretty much tanking through the floor. Uh, that a, could have been any number of gigs aid <laughs> yeah i can't it's it's difficult to narrow down in my <laughs> rich tapestry of bombing hard uh <laughs> but uh but i remember you were you were really really fucking good uh emceeing that night which actually made me feel even worse about myself so thanks a bunch um it was, uh, very much uh me being a good MC was very much aimed at you yeah just to make you feel shit well, that's yeah. I mean, it worked. Thanks, thanks a lot. Um, but then I don't know. In in retrospect, if we look back at that gig, was it that you were amazing, or was it like just by comparison? Like comparison. I was so bad that you came off looking kind of good. Uh, either way, I come off looking very good from that story. So I, I like it. <laughs> yeah, it's a happy story. Um, so yeah, so so that's how James and I know each other, and uh, he's on Twitter, uh, and uh, so am I. And um, I saw one of his updates a couple of weeks ago, where he was advocating for uh, the wonder of train biz, which again we'll we'll touch on shortly. Uh, and I thought, you you know what? I remember this guy. He's pretty funny. Let's get him on the podcast. Uh, let's catch up. Uh, and so here he is. Um, but I guess mm -hmm. bef like before we get into the train biz and the stand up comedy stuff, like how. How did you get into comedy? What the fuck were you doing before that? Tell us a bit about James Benison. Uh, I've been doing comedy for uh, much longer than 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 people realise. Right. Um, I I started like at university, um, and it wasn't doing stand up. Um, I I so I joined. I wasn't good enough to get into any plays in the drama society, um, uh, so I joined the pantomime society, right. which in retrospect was funnier and much more wonderful place to, to go um and i met a fantastic um a gentleman called sid wick um stage name um and uh, so he wanted to start doing like a, a double act type thing so i mm. kind of joined up with him and we started something called slap and giggle um which went for about five years doing sketches and songs and all sorts of things and it was then when i it was with him that i started going up to kind of edinburgh fringe and, and doing a whole variety of uh, shows um, and then when I moved away from Manchester, um, we kind of split up because he uh, had a family, like a loser. Um, sorry, Nate. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
uh, and uh, yeah, no, I just was like, well, I should probably start doing some some solo stuff just to keep me from going insane. Yeah. Um, and it was a really weird transition because I'd had so much experience of like um, being with someone on stage and having all this stage presence, but literally no material of my own that I could like feasibly do on stage. Um, so it was a very strange kind of first kind of year of comedy of, of trying to learn what my actual individual voice is and was um and I, I remember vividly that year he was like uh, james i'm gonna go to edinburgh and do a show by myself is that okay and i was like yeah so so am i um, <laughs> and it was purely out of spite that i decided to uh to go and do a solo show that year and then just carried on yeah uh, doing it kind of every year uh, and then then i started kind of met loads of other comedians um i started doing a, a kids show okay um which annoyingly, basically, I wanted because I wanted to use the same costume for both the kids' show and the grown-up show I was doing. Um, and annoyingly, the kids' show was a lot more successful by several degrees of magnitude. Really? Um, but then yeah, when you, like when you say uh, a lot more successful and kind of annoyingly, is it kind of like you want to be? Because like I always imagine this. But do you, do you know John Long? Yeah, I used to live with him. Oh, really? I had no yeah. idea. Or if I did know that, I forgot it. In which case, apologies. Not, but as as kind of housemates, not lovers, just sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't going to pry. That's fine. Well, you know, um, never say never. But uh, yeah, I mean, don't rule it out. It could still happen. Uh, still time. But uh, but I always sort of thought where because he did children's parties and that that sort of entertainment circuit as well as doing occasionally some quite like dark jokes in his in his stand up set. And I always imagined like if I did do like kids parties and like the entertainment stuff and then if I was good at it, if I was better at that than the stand up, like I kind of want to be like the dark, damaged, misunderstood, like adult, you know, like challenging material, like that sort of stuff. But then wouldn't it be like really wouldn't it torment you if it's like oh fuck but i just happen to be really amazing at the kids stuff it was it was bizarre like, i mean i think uh, so, so i did it with a, a gentleman called timothy goose uh he used to be part of a double act called we are goose um and i think we'd both kind of split up from our respective double act partners and so we kind of got together and formed this children's super group i guess um and like we just basically the, the way we decided to write it was um we'd write a show that we would enjoy seeing and um, but put like lots of like games in essentially to get the kids up on stage to to basically embarrass their parents um which we thought was really funny um and then the kids really enjoyed it because they got to be kind of do horrible things to their parents and and shout and, abuse at me and, and they get to grown-ups stars. liked it they love being Pardon? the star and they love being the star yeah, they, of the show right exactly yeah, yeah it's something that i have in uh common with a lot of children um, but yeah, they, and the grown-ups liked it because you know we we, we had written it for grown-ups in a way, in a way uh, for ourselves. But it's just that we have childish sense of humour, and so it kind of works on on a couple of different levels, and and it and it went really well. So we did it for like th- three years. Yeah, that's it's quite. I imagine that's quite a tough thing to write though, like to make a, a show for kids then accessible and interesting to watch for adults as well. But I suppose that's the sort of line that disney like to strike i i guess you know all yeah, that shrek I mean, is a sort of you know it's a kids movie yes. but there's a lot of funny stuff that happens in it you know yeah we, we yeah no we me and tim i just remember whenever we were writing and stuff it was just the most like i not laughed as hard when we were writing okay this is the stupidest thing this is not going to work let's definitely do it <laughs> um and we just throw a stupid thing in like one of the most uh, like and it's it's going to sound bizarre but it was the most successful thing that we did in the show um was an idea called cake or bomb where my character so my character is um a super villain but who's rubbish at it and so he is there to teach kids how to be evil like him but they're actually there to do all the taking over of the world for him because he can't do it himself because he's useless right <laughs> So we had this stupid game in the middle of it called Cake or Bomb. Um, and the whole concept was that Tim would come out with a tray um, of like li- little little cakes, but the, like the middle one had been ripped in half and a massive bomb had been put in. And, and the kids <laughs> had to take it in turns to guess which was a cake or which was a bomb and then eat it. Yeah. And then if, if they were right, they got a delicious treat. And if it was wrong, then they'd explode. <laughs> and so 
it would kind of the whole joke being that the kids were like, well, that's a cake. Yum. And then it would come to me for the last one. And then I'd get really angry and shout at all the children. <laughs> it, and that, it, like kids loved it. Like people would message us afterwards going, oh yeah, we play cake or bomb every day at breakfast. And I'm like, how, how would, what yeah. are you doing? Oh man. That's that actually sounds like quite a lot of fun. It's like, you know, cause it did the, the instinctive reaction when, somebody says to me that they do kids parties or they do kids entertainment is as i say like i i'm like oh man like that must be tough or yeah like i would have to fake it i'd have to fake being into it and interested in it and stuff but it actually i guess like you say like as long as you can find ways of making it a little bit that sounds almost a bit dark <laughs> yeah know? well no, it, it was very dark all the way through but like me and tim like because we were together doing it we would try and make each other laugh as much as we we're trying to make the kids and the grown-ups laugh yeah yeah and so okay so let's uh let's spool forward a little bit so you did uh you did the fringe a couple of times as a double act you've done some solo shows what kind of stuff was mm -hmm. you, you was your solo shows kind of like observational like reflective stuff or uh no so um basically it would be i would have an idea or a project in mind and the show would be the culmination of said project and me presenting my findings of it so the one that won the award and was like the finalist of another award um was a show called how to be a superhero um the whole concept of that was is that i'm a massive superhero nerd uh, and i had spent a year trying to get real life superpowers by recreating origin stories of famous superheroes basically right any way i possibly could and i was in this massive spandex outfit um and um and it was me presenting my findings but it was kind of like a a kind of superhero story origin kind of and it finished with um, me getting two audience members to act out the like massive supervillain battle um at the end and it was um yeah it was really it's very like it's that it was very grounded in reality but with a very silly kind of clearly this guy is deranged and has invented the superhero origin story over the top of it yeah um, it's quite and, creative uh, mate it's sort of um because like when i was I, you know i was joking earlier about like doing research on you but i did like i had a quick look to see what stand-up you had on youtube but i it's just draws blanks and i wonder for something like that conceptual and when there's awards flying around i wondered if maybe like have you got stuff online that people can watch or... uh, you know what i took i took a load of stuff down just because i was um because it, it was uh, it, you all know this like when you start doing comedy that's when you film everything so that you yeah. learn how to be better um, by watching it back and going, oh god, oh no, I don't <laughs> like it. Um, and then the kind of as you get better and better at it, then I stop recording it. So all the stuff that was on there were from like my first kind of year of comedy when, like, I went back and watched it and went, oh, this is shit. Yeah. Um, and so I was just like, I don't want this on online anymore because then people will watch it and go, oh, this must be the the height of his height of his comedy co comedic comedic writing yeah. And I was like, no, it was much better, but like, it's so hard to film like an hour long show and. Yeah. get the good bits kind of out of it especially when it's so highly conceptual like that i felt like because i i did a hour-long show and i i considered it the peak of my like because at that point i knew that me and my girlfriend would be trying for a baby the following year so i was like well look if i'm gonna do some sort of show and film it and always have that so i've you know i've worked my ass off for like four years gigging and gigging and it will all build up to this and at least then if we have kids and i can't get out and gig anymore i'll always have this and I considered it at the time, like the peak, it was all of my best sort of bits all weaved together into this very loosely put together kind of concept thing. Uh, and I was super proud of it. And then, do you know what? I watched it about six months ago and I'm like, oh, like I'm so, <laughs> so over this. This is, uh, you know, so it's, like it's so difficult watching yourself. Back. Yeah, but it's like it's I, I feel like it's worse because like what you're talking about is like your early gigs you know your first gig or your fifth gig or 12th gig where you can see like yo i was really like raw there that was before i developed some skill and but now like i look at the pinnacle of what i was doing and i'm like <laughs> just don't know maybe i'll stick to podcasting uh, there is part of me that wishes i'd like recorded like some of the latest stuff that i did but no no I think, like, maybe record some audio, like, put some audio out. Because then it's sort of, you know, it's, people are more forgiving, I think, of audio because it could, it just sounds like a bit of a bootleg. And it, whereas if you film stuff with your, like, camera phone 
and it's in like a little open mic or new material night and the you know the camera phone's like <laughs> lent up against a pint glass and there's people like right next to it giggling or chatting or like it's, i don't know it's hard to make that most people would not watch that but i think an audio would well, be right. well, one of my favorite things that's ever happened like uh, a gig i think it was, a, it was a charity gig in edinburgh um just Stuart goldsmith yeah um, he he. Um, so the, it, all all these big comedians were kind of bigish, big big for us yeah. uh, comedians were, were doing this charity gig, and um, someone set up a little camera mm. to, to film a set, and so someone had pointed it out and taken the piss out of it, going, "Who's filming like this charity set?" And it was Stuart Goldsmith, and he came on. And he said, "Look, um, I've only got a five minute set, and I really need to record something for quite a big opportunity in America." <laughs> and someone went, "Is it Conan?" And he went, "Yes, it's it's Conan, but." This is the only five minute set that I'm doing in Edinburgh. So I'm going to go off. I'm going to come on. If you could just all be really supportive. That would be really nice. And the audience collectively decided to fuck it up for him uh, oh. in the most lovely way possible. <laughs> and so he came on and went, Stuart Goldsmith. And he came on and he got a two and a half minute standing ovation. <laughs> everyone was going, Way! And then, like the last two and a half minutes, they just basically carried him outside, carried him <laughs> like crowd surf, whilst everyone was shout- chanting, Conan, Conan, Conan. Yeah. And he was just going, <sighs> Yeah. I like it though. I like that sort of, uh, you know, it, he wants support. Let's really give him support. Let's take it to the nth degree, but, you know? I, just, I love it. It's just that unspoken, like everyone in the audience went, Oh, let's. Let's fuck it up. Yeah, it's a very British thing, to yes. do, isn't it? It's like a, there's a there's it seems supportive, it seems positive. It's like let's really go to town on being really super po- but actually there's a level of malice, like you know. <laughs> let's fuck him up, but in a really nice way. Yeah, you can't even complain about it else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh so so let's go back to your uh, your comedy career as it were uh so yes. you 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 did the fringe a bunch bunch of times um then you did uh, brighton fringe um then the pandemic hit and was it around then i'm guessing that sort of things went on pause to some extent and you've just uh, i mean so it was a bit before then actually i think I, I i i moved to brighton which is where i live now I live now um and i'd done a few gigs since i got down here and i just i'll be honest I, I was getting tired of the stress and the pressure of like writing new stuff and um i just realized that like my mental health wasn't in a great place at the time anyway and, and it was just making it kind of putting lots lots of pressure on me a, a lot more so i kind of stopped doing it and then i kind of got a job which was like mostly evenings and weekends uh, so there was just no time to do it, and so it got a lot more difficult. I, I did, I have done gigs, and they mostly if they've been paid or if it's for friends, and I know it's going to be a really good fun. Um, so I, I did gig last year in, in Reading for um, Lucas Jolson, who's a lovely chap in who does gigs in Reading. Um, but yeah, it's just been like what maybe the odd gig here and there, but but I've not been like pursuing it as a big thing, um, kind of much at all, really. Yeah, it's sort of. I think there's a couple of things, isn't there? Like, well, maybe there's sort of two, three, four different ways that people seem to kind of fall out of love with it. The first one is, is you know, selfishly, from my perspective, you have a family. Uh, it's really fucking difficult to get out of the house. So that yeah. makes it an easy exit because you're just like, well, <laughs> I guess that's that done then. Um, yeah. Uh, and then you've got the pandemic. I think that kind of closed a lot of doors for people, you know, quite literally. Venues being shuttered. Um uh comedians having to sort of seek employment elsewhere um taking jobs that may they maybe wouldn't necessarily have done like if they'd had the freedom uh like i i knew a few mcs and comedians who weren't like they weren't really making a good living at comedy but they were making just enough to to kind of call themselves semi-pro you know like this is you know absolutely i work in a cafe or i work in a restaurant or i work in a call center but then i also make a little bit of wedge out comedy and that's enough to get me by but for those guys it was like the pandemic came along and it was just fucking dream smashed um yeah. and, and now of course like they're in a, a sticky situation where they've become reliant on the money that they now get from the job that they took when all the venues were closed 
So now they're like, ah, fuck, I can't even get back to like sort of the, the romantic semi pro kind of thing because now I've got this bill and that phone and this car and, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, the pandemic killed so much. Um, and like, no, I, 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 to be fair, it's, uh, the old job I had, I, I literally just started a new job and I've now got my evenings and weekends back. And there is that old part of me mm. now just going, why don't you just, why don't you just, why don't you just, why don't you just give it a shot? Yeah. Let's see, let's see, let's see if you've still got it. Do you think it's like an addiction? Do you think it's like, because I feel like it is. Absolutely is, yeah. Like it never goes away in the same way that I hear addicts talk about substances. Like I I watched a thing once where Russell Brand was talking about how he hasn't done heroin for, you know, decades. But when he sees old footage of himself, this is like old videos of him sparking up, you know, lighting foil and all that stuff. And he looks at himself doing the drugs and he's like, I really fucking want to do those drugs like right now. And it's like it ne- that addict part of his brain never goes away. And I, th- I like I'm sure they're very different, <laughs> you know, heroin addiction and open mic comedy or semi pro comedy, very different beasts. But it is a sort of thing where like I haven't set foot on a stage for two years, three years now. And yet still, if there was an open mic night like round the corner, I would be a little bit like, oh, I wonder if I could nip in there. I wonder if I could nip in. And... It, it, I mean, you say it's different from kind of heroin. I, I think there's, there are similarities, though, because like it, when you get up on stage and you make a room full of people cackle with laughter, mm. that adrenaline high that you get from that, there's nothing quite like it. Yeah. But on the same vein of bombing on stage, there's nothing worse than that feeling of coming <laughs> up and going, I am a piece of shit. Yeah. Like, and chasing that high, I think, is a lot of the reason why comedians do what they do. It's, it's that kind of narcissistic kind of urge to feel kind of the adoration of strangers. And it's a real, it's a real rush. Yeah. But it's also, it's not helped by itself in the sense that if you crack, they, especially a new joke, something that you thought up at three o'clock that, that afternoon, and you're like, I'm going to fucking try that tonight. And then you go down there, and there's that risk element to it where it could tank. And then you try it, and maybe it does tank. And then you feel fucking terrible about yourself. But then the next night, you try the same bit and you've tweaked it a bit. And because the previous iteration of it made you feel so bad, now when it works, it's like it, it doubles the high. It's, so it's like the addiction yeah. just it becomes self-perpetuating in a way absolutely yeah no i i I have often thought of it like like an addiction and i think so my the job i've had for the last three years was working in an escape room which i know you don't know anything about i know fuck all about this please educate me um okay so sidebar an escape room is essentially um you come with a group of friends like between two to seven of you normally um, and you get put in a room, which uh, and in the very kind of early days, the door would be locked and you had to solve the puzzles around the room to try and get out. Right. So basically you'd be looking for stuff or there'd be things on the wall or things hidden around and you'd find keys or, or solve puzzles and get codes to open boxes to find further things. And it's just it's a really good, fun experience um, to do with your mates, which genuinely you get to see the absolute worst of humanity. <laughs> kind of um especially wait, wait, when wait, you're wait, wait. is this like it's really fun for you and your mates because you see the worst of humanity or it's not fun for them but it's fun for you because you get to see the worst of them i mean it's a bit of both i, I play a lot of escape rooms and it's great after you it's a big, big adrenaline rush because you've got only got 60 minutes to do everything yeah um and so when there's a time pressure on you doing something like that suddenly um your, your girlfriend who you love in the world you'll be going just pick up the fucking key and like <laughs> it just comes out of you yeah. um it's, it's horrible that's like I, i'm but at hosting um like generally the one that i worked at we try and make it a very immersive experience so um like the whole kind of feet they're all different themes and this ours was like science so i would meet them as a mad scientist um and uh like give them a briefing in character and it was great because it was like a bit of comedy because i they would talk to me and it was a conversation and i just ripped the shit out of them yeah. or make jokes about them if they were stag dudes and hen dudes which you, you get quite a lot of like you can go oh i'm gonna go to town on, on the, these boys they they, yeah. they ask for it uh, and so that you get that fix of of comedy from, from doing that but sitting back and watching people do it you just see you, you get to know what hu- humankind is like and i'll be honest 80 percent of the time just absolute despair at how we've got this far as humans yeah like 
the stupid things people try and get do they're just like why it makes no sense what you're saying and doing yeah uh, does it kind of is it like people get angrier than you would necessarily you would you would ordinarily think they do or they they're impatient a that, yeah. it, but a bit, bit, definitely a bit of that more than that it's them going maybe we'll try this even though this makes absolutely no sense at all yeah i thought i found something long and thin so maybe i should just put it in this hole i can see yeah. and you're like that's it's 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 just a it's just a screw it's just a screw <laughs> hole that you just you just put it in like what yeah. like and people just doing bizarre things going well uh i'm going to invent a new code now which like, like this has got four letters in the word uh and or well over there it, there's a a number four with a yellow background and bananas are yellow so maybe this is a number four <laughs> yeah. you're like wow you really i mean it's not that complicated like what you really are you allowed to be are you allowed to be cunty to them like if they're obviously being stupid can you be i don't like know if you're allowed and... to be but i i am <laughs> I, I was just i was such a dick <laughs> and it's the it, I just I love it. You have to turn it down with the kids in there, but even then, yeah. If you do something stupid. I'm going to tell you, you're doing something stupid. Yeah. Uh, but then if it's like stag stag groups, and they do something oh. stupid, and they're a bit pissed, and then you roast them for it, do you get like have you pissed anyone off? Have they punched you? <laughs> no, because I, I I think I mean I think it's the the comedian instinct um, that we have. I, I know what the line is. More importantly than that. I know that when you have a stag do, you pick on, I don't want to say pick on the weakest member, but pick on the, the loudest dickhead there. As long as everyone else in the group is pissing themselves laughing, yeah, they can't get angry at you because then they look like a knobhead. Yeah. Um, and and so I was very good at picking my jokes and picking my battles. And then everyone else going, ah, yeah, you are. You are a fucking idiot. <laughs> um, and then I look like a legend for, for, for calling them out on it. Yeah. Well, it sounds like that. That sounds like a pretty good job to fall into. In wait, was this at the beginning of the pandemic, or was this before the pandemic? It was before, way before the pandemic, um, and they were of really course, good. The pandemic, I'm guessing they wouldn't be in an enclosed space, <laughs> right? Uh, but they were really good at like furloughing us th- throughout it, which was which was really good. We didn't have to do. Yeah. Um, but I, I was lucky to work for a really good company called. If you're in Brighton, Bewilderbox. Uh, they were f- fantastic escape rooms and just fantastic people. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's really good for me. You should go try, go try do one sometime. Yeah, I might do. I don't know. Maybe I'll if I get married, if I if I ever get round to proposing, then I'll uh, I'll put it on my list of stuff to do for my stag weekend. Oh wow! Oh, oh my lord! Where did there that you come go. from? There's the beers coming out. Like, we yeah. sometimes get couples coming in do it, and like Valentine's Day, we had a load of couples coming in. My God, they were just the thick. They were so thick. Like I was like, is this what you have in common that you? You're, you're both so stupid and, and you, you bond over that. Is that is that what's happening? <laughs> yeah, but or, or do you think it's like one of them is stupid and the other one is just like kind of being nice and romantic? Like I can't lambast her for being a fucking idiot. I'll it's tell you fantastic. what did happen once. Um, I, I witnessed a breakup in the escape room. Really? Once. It was the best thing. It was just like, because I'm just watching through CCTV and I could talk to them. Yeah, like over a microphone, as if I'm like some artificial intelligence. So it's just like watching Love Island, where you can talk to the contestants. But oh, it was this very, very young couple. They were like 19, I think, and it was her birthday. Oh, fuck. And in, from the very beginning, she was very argumentative. She uh, it was like she didn't want to be there. I found out it was because when she was walking up the stairs, she broke a nail. Oh right. And so she wanted to take out her upset on the world. Yeah. Unfortunately, when you're locked in a room with just your boyfriend, there's only one person you can take that out on, yeah. and it's him. Um, and so <laughs> she was just like st- trying to start a fight with him. She was like, "I'm not bothered with these puzzles." And she kept, she was like, "You're not explaining the puzzles to me, God. What's wrong with you?" And he was just ignored her and just got on with it. And that annoyed her even more and even more. Eventually, she just went, "You know what? Fuck you. I'm just going to go and get a beer, enjoy your little escape room." And then she just stormed out of the room. Wow. Like, um, and he was just left standing in the room and it, he just went, James, um, can I just finish by myself? And I was like, I think you better get used to that, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Did him. Yeah, it was great. God, that, how that, fucking awkward. That, 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 the one line. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how fucking like, I mean, 
I don't think I've ever seen anyone publicly break up like that outside of like my hometown back in the day this is not really a work thing it's like you know every everyone's hometown when you drive through the town center at like 11 o'clock at night or 11 30 and they, like, it's pub kicking out time i used to see couples then like arguing and breaking up like drunk dudes on their knees their girlfriend in tears and like something's happened in the pub like you know maybe she she caught him like looking at her friend or but they're a bit pissed everyone's had a few beers and so it ends up in this fucking like i don't know 17th century painting scene like where he's like on his knees out out the front of the bell in maidenhead his girlfriend's <laughs> there like crying like mascara and he's there just going like oh, i love you louise like that. <laughs> was like, and she's not even looking at him she's just like no like looking the other way and uh it's my favorite thing to watch man yeah it's, i just i love it i should have parked up and just sat there with a you know bag of popcorn or something but um yeah but yeah so i've seen stuff like that but i've never seen like at work i don't think anyone break actually oh fuck i've just remembered something i used to work at in a bowling alley and uh and there was a girl there who like every fuck god this is gonna sound so mean-spirited and cunty go on shall i say it Fuck it. Yeah, let's just commit to it now. All right. I'm never going to see her again, so fuck it. Uh, so there was a girl that I worked with in the sales office who would not shut the fuck up about her boyfriend, right? And this kind of... I know this sounds really cunty, James, but there is a kind of person who only ever talks about their partner, whether it's their girlfriend or their boyfriend, and every single fucking sentence or story or paragraph is peppered with their fucking partner's name and what their partner would say or think about it. And it's really fucking tedious. Because like, if you're on the end of it, it's like, no, I'm talking to you, James. I don't, don't like, why are you Why are you bringing whoever into it? Like, let's have a conversation with yeah. just you and me. But this would go it's, on it's, it's, for like I mean, months. It's, it's either because you are like... You have no other personality. You, you found someone and they're now your personality. Precisely. Or it's because you're just so dull. You have nothing else in your life. You, and you, every other waking moment, you're not at work. You're with this person. Yeah. I think it's like a, a symptom of immense insecurity, which, again, like I feel shitty now sort of bringing it up or like saying what I'm about to say. Please do that. I'm, re yeah. I'm really gonna I'm still going to say it. Yeah, I don't feel that yeah. bad. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> but but it's it comes from insecurity i think it's like these people need to know that i have a boyfriend these people need to know that i'm in a relationship that i'm worthy of love uh i think that's where it comes from but yes yeah yeah but yeah so if every fucking thing that she said or answered to or you know fucking conversations with customers on the phone she's just like okay oh, yeah, no, i'll have to tell my boyfriend about this later. and i'm just like every time she said it me and this other guy who worked in there would just go like you know pinch your nose to like relieve the stress because you just fucking hate it so much and uh and then one day about six or seven months into this uh we both me and this mate of mine come into the sales office and she's just she's just sat there in floods of tears devastated and me and this I, like i looked over him i was just like fuck like what's what's what is wrong with her <laughs> the Cheshire cat grin, the shit eating grin on his face was just like he's sat back in his office chair, just like so happy. And I said, is everything all right? And she's like, like me and this gentleman's name. She's like me and he like we we, we broke up. And I, I was like, oh, OK, all right. Like, did you just go and get yourself a coffee. And then I looked over at this mate of mine and he just like, as soon as she left the sales office door, it was like an explosion, a fucking firework display of laughter. I was like, <laughs> there's, I mean, there's very few moments in professional life, particularly in a bowling alley sales office that can elicit that much joy. <laughs> like, I, I, I imagine so. It's uh, so, yeah, I don't know. Does that count as a in, in work breakup? Sort of. Kind of. Kind of. I think it's always it's very, it's very weird because like when you're in an escape room, you forget that there's someone watching you the entire time. Yeah, and and someone is, and so you you. I I, I know when I play escape rooms, I I completely forget, and like so so when I the last train beers that I had, I was going to London to do an escape room, mm. and I completely forgot someone was watching. And you know, I'm not going to say I'm the best. Wank, did you? No, but at the same oh. time, I some of the people I was with complained that I threw things at them. Um, 
and in fairness, they were in the way. I love how uh, I was just I love how lawyered the surface. I love how lawyered that statement is. It's like it's not I threw things at people. It's like some people complained that I may have <laughs> thrown things. No, no, there's no admission of guilt here. No, no. Let's talk about train beers then. So please uh, do. So this is something that you, uh, James tweeted for this, for benefit of listeners and viewers and stuff. Uh, James tweeted a couple of weeks ago saying um, something along the lines of like, I'm on a train alone going to a like stag or like, to a, a weekend thing. Uh, only one thing for it, train beers. And then there was updates. Then there was like more, more photos of every time you were like cracking open another beer. But it was like every, every tweet would be peppered with like a, uh, well, also more train beers like that. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it sparked a lot of debate on on the the Twitter. It's probably the most like like Twitter debate thing. Like, the most people have talked to me on Twitter ever. Really, I think. you found yeah, your, and it was, it was your like niche. so like. Well, it was just so divisive of people like like you going yes train beers. I can't be on a train without a beer. No, <laughs> and like other people going. Um, I think you might have a problem, mate. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I thought you were going to say something like um, uh, that people were going to like be judgy because that's the reaction that I've had. Yeah, ju- the judgment be that, that I've got a problem for drinking. Yeah. By well, myself yeah, suppose, on the train. Yeah. yeah, they're sort of like overlapping there, aren't they? In in that sense, but it's like so. I I tweeted you back and said like, yeah, like I'm I'm a fucking card carrying member of Train Beers Club because solidarity. Um, yeah thank you uh it's like for me it's sort of i go into london on a thursday uh and and i go into the office and i do my day of work and then i might catch up with a friend or something and then by the time i get back to waterloo uh I, it's been a long day and i can either sit on the train and probably fall asleep because by that time i've you know met up with a friend and maybe i've had a couple of beers already so i'm going to be tired and the rocking motion of the train and all that is going to send me off or i can kick back crack an, open a, a can of beaver town and just you know mm-hmm. de-stress just sort of enjoy myself so a I, little bit i think i think there's there's two types of train beers uh maybe three no there's two there's two types there's one where like you say you've had a few beers out already or maybe sometimes a lot of beers out and then you're on your train going home or whatever i think train beers are 100 percent justified because by the time you're home you, without the extra beer in you you're gonna start having a headache and that's it's just a medical thing in in that case yeah the other kind of train beer is what i was doing last week going i'm about to go out and have some fun let's start the party a couple of hours early on a train (laughs) by myself (laughs) yeah no i get that it's sort of but i i don't think people necessarily differentiate between those two situations i think in fact i know because uh not this not yesterday but the last time I did train beers on my way back home, I was texting some friends and I was saying, I'm sat on a train. I've got a can of IPA open. And I swear to God, like this really big Asian lady who was sat like just, I don't know why it's important that she's Asian, just big lady. All big. Like eyeballing me, like just like really like eye judging. And I felt bad. Like I knew what I was doing was wrong somewhere deep within. Like it's a faux pas. Like it's maybe she wanted a, a train beer herself. I, I, do you know what? I should have offered. Like, would you like some? Yeah, maybe it's jealousy. Yeah, it could have been. Say, saying it though, like I got one of the last trains home, and I continued with the train beers, and because it was like the last train home to Brighton, like I was had to share a table. Everyone there, I was ha- having train beers as well, and we just train beer. We we all became like the closest of friends on the way home. We would do someone had like wrote a pub quiz. It was bizarre. Um, <laughs> it was a lovely experience. You, you can find new friends through train beers. You can yeah. also lose the respect of all your loved ones. Yeah. And that's the risk. Yeah. Well, I, well, this is the other thing is if I, if I was a completely different person and I saw me like my exact face and demeanor and just like 9 30 PM disheveledness, if I saw me opening up a can of beer on a train, what would I think? Like, would I be judgy? And I think, honestly, the answer to that is yes. I would are, are you in a suit or uh, a shirt? Shirt and uh, sort of smart-ish trousers, yeah, and shoes. See, I would probably just go, it's Thursday. This guy's had a, he's been at work. He's had a, a train beer. 
I, I, I don't think I'd judge. I'd just be like, good on you, mate. Yeah. Well, thank you. But You're a nice guy, I'm though, not, James. Not everyone's that I'm a nice, nice person. I'm, I'm not very judgmental because I, 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 I'm a, I do train beers. <laughs> Yeah, but that's the thing. Like you're you're a decent chap, so you wouldn't judge other people because you do train beers. I also do train beers, but I would still judge other people. Yeah, for... that, that, that that's that says more about you. I think. Yeah, yeah. Maybe the problem is me. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's a uh, it's a it's a funny one. It's like with with drinking on a train. It's like you couldn't get a clearer example of what the differences are between how people perceive you based on what drink you have right so if i sit right. down on a train and i crack open a beer that i feel like there's some stink on it there's going to be some judgment there but i've been on trains before where like a an executive assistant like a, a woman in her late 30s has come on and you know you can buy those like marks and spencers like one glass of wine <laughs> G and T's or G and T's, yeah. Like I've I've been on trains where they just sort of sit down, you know, they put their sort of thing back there and like then just open up, and nobody would fucking judge that woman at all. They'd just be like, yeah, she's had a hard day, you know, she's oh, city you woman. You say and... that? Do you not remember that? Many years ago now, what's her? The uh, Labour politician Diane. I want to say Diane Abbott. Yes, that's her. Yeah, she got fucking she... crucified for it. Crucified. She had a gin and tonic on the on the train, and everyone just laid into her. Train. Yeah, just leave her alone. She's had a hard week. I went out the next week and just was loads of pictures of myself. Yeah, like going, I stand, I, I drink with Diane Abbott. Yeah, well, ironically, I think it made her more popular around, among some sort of subsets of the left folk. Uh, yes. Uh, in fact, I think I remember reading somewhere uh, that there were bars that were naming like gin-based cocktails after her. Like, yeah, I'll have a Diane Absolutely. Abbott, thanks. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I think that's a weird thing about politics, isn't it? Where no matter how much one side tries to demonise or attack someone, and sometimes it's for a very good reason, like it will just make them more popular with their actual kind of fan base. That's like, true. That's why Trump, like, was like he was, I mean, a walking disaster, like of a person. But like the more people went, but look, he's shit and stupid and a dangerous person but more his family went how dare you yeah well there was that and there's also a big thing with politics in the us and the uk now where half of the support that somebody like trump uh can garner is actually off the back of this group of people really enjoying how much he annoys them so it's like yeah I don't even like Trump that much. I just like how wound up he gets you fucking lily livered liberal. Like there's a real element of that. I've heard that from yeah. intelligent adult men in the UK. It's like, <laughs> I yeah, I didn't even vote for Brexit. I just fucking love how wound up everyone, like all you fucking liberals get over Brexit. Like that's a, that's a, a healthy chunk, I think, of that sort of alt-right populace. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I just have despaired so much over politics that i just it i, I can't i just i just can't anymore it yeah. just makes me sad i there's, i'm sure there's a lot of humor to be derived by the whole thing but i can't it, not for me i can't it just makes me want to cry yeah well it's getting worse as well it's sort of i think it started off being a little bit funny like when trump first announced he was going to go for the presidency i was like oh fucking hell get a load of this clown uh, yeah. And kind of ditto with Boris Johnson. I was like, he'll probably get it. But, you know, look at the state of him. Like, he'll, I'm sure he'll be ejected from power in the first 10 months because he'll either be incompetent or corrupt or people will see he's not fit for the job. And, and now yeah, it's getting... But, he, but not only was all of that true, that he, he was all of those things, people then voted him back in again. Yeah. Uh, Mike so. Yeah. And it was... It's, I just... That's the thing. It, like, it, it, I, What the hell is going on, Ace? Well, here's my advice, right? If you feel disillusioned with politics, this really does help. Uh, so before Brexit, things were already getting quite bad. And so I started this sort of this uh, tactic that I thought, what's the worst thing that could happen in this next juncture? So in that instance, it was like we could lose the referendum. And I thought like, well, maybe what I'll do is I'll put 50 quid on vote leave like on betfair politics and then if we do leave if if the vote goes the wrong way at least i've made like 200 quid out of it or whatever it was uh 
you must be fucking loaded, mate. And I it, actually, I didn't win as much as I thought I would do. But uh, yeah, it came back like sort of over 100 percent return. Um, and uh, and the same with Trump, like as it was leading up to the Clinton Trump election, I was like, what's the worst that could happen here? I really don't want Trump to be president. But if he has to be, I may as well make some money out of it. Uh, and it, you know what? It really helped, James. That's a great that's great advice that I'd never considered before. And I'm definitely going to do. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to, you know, we, we've both already established that we may potentially be addicts, what with comedy and everything. And um, oh, we can both be somewhat uh, susceptible to mental health challenges. So I don't want to push Train you bits. into gambling as well. But... Yeah, I, I do have a very addictive personality, but I want to just goes, um, I just won't do it then. And then I just don't. And it's fine. But that's good. Good for you. I also have. Do I have an addictive personality? Uh, I get impulsive and obsessed over things. Is that the same? Um, no, no. I, th I think that's a that's a creative. That's a creative thing. Like when you first get an idea about something, and you do kind of get so obsessed with it. And you're like, I've got to do this, and you get put all your passion. And uh, like, I'm got a personality that I'll do that for like a week, and then it'll fizzle out, and then I'll never finish it. Um, that's which interesting. Is kind of, it's kind of why I liked having the fringe because I'm doing the fringe because I would be like, well, I'm just booking a show yeah, and then I've got to do it. Yeah. I've got to write it. Otherwise I'm going to look like a complete dickhead. Um, it's good to have and, that like milestone in the diary and to be a bit scared yeah. by it. I think to have something Brighton to work fringe towards. It's great. great. Like just like the, that week leading up to the first weekend of Brighton fringe was just panic, 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 panic. And then the first weekend of doing an okay ish show, yeah um then like by the end of the fringe going that's a really good show now yeah is it is brighton fringe like a month long as well i guess it would be yeah it's may um and so like i i tend my, my kind of pattern when i um I don't, as i say i did it for like 10 years was to to write a show for brighton fringe mm. um by the end of may i've got it's been workshopped it's been tested with audiences it's it's good yeah um, and then try and get as many previews between may and august for edinburgh as I possibly could. And there was like Camden Fringe in there as well and a few of the little ones that pop up. Yeah. Um, yeah. John Mayer was on a couple of weeks ago uh, and he had a real sort of bug to bear. Bug to bear? Is that the... Or bugbear, sorry. A bugbear. A bone. Bone to pick with... Uh, like he did, yeah. Basically his vibe was that he didn't really uh, love Edinburgh Fringe uh, and he was taking this sort of slightly different route to like effectively rent a theatre in London do his show there and invite producers down and agents and, and all that stuff. Um, do you have that same sort of sense? Well, like, like, I mean, you're exploring Brighton Fringe. You mentioned Camden a minute ago. Like, is, do you do you see yourself sort of more sticking around that neck of the woods rather than constantly trekking up to Edinburgh nope. and forking out 10 grand and all that shit? If I, if I do end up writing with the show, I'm probably just going to do it in London and, and Brighton. Um, Edinburgh, I... Uh, some of my favourite memories are at Edinburgh Fringe. Some of my worst memories are also at Edinburgh Fringe. Um, and to go up and do Edinburgh, which I think I recommend if you are starting to do comedy or, or do comedy, it's w worth doing at least once because it does make you a better comedian having to perform the same show every single day for yeah. three, four weeks. Um, the problem with it is, though, is that it, it is, especially if you live down south, You've got to take a huge chunk out of your life to do it. And it's just so expensive and so exploitative of performers. Um, like no one makes any money apart from the, the big venues and uh, and like the, the producers and things like that. Like the actual performers make nothing. Yeah. Um, they, but they, they will still go there because it's the biggest arts festival in the world um and it's the kind of place to be but like to go up there you're looking at like two grand for rent like what six four to six hundred quid for uh to be in the guide yeah um like so much more money for like marketing um and then like for venue hire it's you know thousands of pounds unless you're doing free fringe mm. um it's it's just and then the, you're never ever going to make that money back no. There's, there's no way in hell you will. This is what John so was basically saying. you're just taking a month out of your life at cost to go and like drain every shred of dignity you have. Um, yeah. But it's kind of like, like so. So John's vibe on it was 
he was like not everyone can afford to take a month out of their job or like to spaff all of their annual leave for their entire year on that that festival uh and exactly in, what I did. oh really yeah. yeah i mean i've heard like, that's that's um, basically the situation for a lot of people is they're like i can't go home and see my family at christmas because i'm using all of my annual leave yeah. to do edinburgh that, uh, that was exactly exactly i think I, I managed to have five days left over yeah um and that was just kind of i had to use it for weddings and other stuff that kind of popped up but yeah I, I, that, that those that month kind of just just like and all my savings went into it so i had no money yeah a John was saying yeah. like it's it's at a point now where you if if you're just a bog standard act who wants to get their name into the guide uh which is a little pamphlet for anyone listening that doesn't know about edinburgh fringe so to get your name billed so that people might see it and might decide to come to your show with a snappy title hopefully um uh costs more hundreds of pounds and and everyone hikes the rents up so if you're renting uh uh a little shoebox room for the month that's now significantly more expensive than it would be any other time of year the year so um the whole month being up there uh for aspiring comedians who are already usually quite financially strapped uh the target john was saying was like you could end up coming out of there only five grand in debt <laughs> like at the end of it yeah. like wow fucking hell that's like yeah. maxed out credit card when you've got no sort of serious income coming in to clear it. It's like, and then a, a huge part of the the fringe as well is the the so, social aspect of it as well. Yeah. And then beer prices are huge. Food to actually eat up there is massive as well. And there's so many. And then you want to go and see other shows too. You want you want to go support the people that you meet up there. And so that's another huge added expense that you don't really account for when you're you're kind of but trying to frantically budget or plan for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean the amount of I'm, I'm still kind of reeling from the debts from, from doing it for literally ten years in have a you, row. Have you thought about like if you did do another fringe show, what the concept would be? I haven't yet. I'll I tell you what. I, I there was only very recently I um, applied to be on an upcoming Channel Four reality TV series oh, called Beauty that. and the Geek. Oh. Um, which was well, it came out in 2006 and bringing it back spoiler yeah um i got down to like the very final kind of um possible contestants and then they didn't want me because i'm too old um and the kind of women who go on that show are all going to be in their early 20s and they thought having a 33 year old nerd who's talking about dungeons and dragons all the time yeah. might look a bit weird um so i didn't get onto it but i did think if i went on there and did this whole experience i would write a show about it and because i almost certainly would come across looking like a complete moron like however they edit it together yeah and i thought that would just be a really good concept for a show um but yeah i've not I, I've, I've not it, it would have to be a really good concept i, I wouldn't want to do half ass it no that's the thing like i think that's my biggest regret with the one that that i did is I I was so desperate to do this sort of like hour show and to have it filmed and edited and locked down. Uh, I just kind of patchwork quilt sewed a load of routines together and then tried to wrap a sort of clumsy concept around it. It didn't really work. And now I'm sort of like, if I was going to do another show, I'm comp I'm shit out of ideas in terms of what the concept would be. And I don't want it to be like yeah. just a you know the standard neurotic kind of self obsessed. 41 year old man walking on stage going like hey well you know let me tell you what i think about feminism and fucking self-checkouts you know like a, yeah i want to make it meaty you know what you mean like i think there's a, a real kind of problem especially with what i kind of did is that most comedians will do what you've done they'll try out material over a long period of time and then they'll finally have an hour-long show of just their best bits of material that they've mastered and there's not really like a through line for it Whereas what I did was try and create a story with like a bit, all of it was brand new material and none of it really was transferable to go to like open mic nights for five yeah. minutes, 10 minutes and actually try the material out. So a lot of the material, like maybe 80, 90% of the material that I was doing was me doing it for the first time on stage at Brighton Fringe and sit, hoping it was as funny as it was in my head. Um, what's, your, what's your hit rate, do you reckon? But like every idea, every joke that you write down, how many out of 20 do you think like actually hit and land? I think the longer I went on, the kind of 
the, it, the more of a sense you get for it. I would say it was like it was it was I'd say maybe 13, 14. Really? That's pretty good. Yeah, I, I think it's all right. Like, I, like I. I mean, it's not, I, I'm, I'm looking. Maybe I'm looking back with rose tinted glasses, but like genuinely, some of my very best ideas have come like just before I was about to go on stage, having a poo, um, and sat there and went, oh, I, and I, I genuinely remember this one moment. I've, I've been doing this bit. It was very early on in my like when I was doing solo stand up. I was doing this bit, and I just it just didn't end. I didn't have an end for it. And I remember this one gig. I just was sat in the toilet and went. That's the end. That's the end of that bit. I've just, I've just thought of the end of that bit. Yeah. I got up and tried it, and it just slayed. And I was like, done, done. Yeah. I'm going back. To, I'm going back for another poo now. I'm going to see what else. <laughs> doing. Yeah, that's cool, man. Like it's, it's nice that uh, you've you developed that level of confidence where you learn to kind of trust your instinct on uh, on what's going to work and what might come across as a bit hack or what you think the audience just won't get. Um, yeah. I, I feel like I was probably about like seven out of 20. Not like I, I knew when something was definitely going to work. Uh, but then there was a lot of stuff where I'd be like, that could, yeah, I think there's something funny in that. And then you go on stage and you try and sort of work. It's very, a, a very sort of Steve McLean kind of approach, like where he, he doesn't even know really if it's going to work. It's like 50, 50 and he gets up on stage and he, then it, he just keeps saying it in different ways at different venues to different audiences until eventually he's fucking batted the shit out of it so much that it's been dented into the shape of something that actually works. If that makes sense. I mean, I know I I'm, I think I'm very confident in my sage persona and that I could talk my way out of anything. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm, I realized there was one genuinely terrible gig that I realized Oh crap! If I don't have any material, I can still make people laugh and entertain people for five minutes. Just, just thinking off the top of my head. Um, I, I don't cool. know. It's, it's, it's a really a, a lot of story. It was ages ago. It, you remember? Oh, what was it called? It was, it was a night. It was a dirty dicks night. Um, and the, the theme of it was like the, the first act. All the acts would go and do one minute of stand up. Yeah. And then they'd pick the best, like, five or six. And then the second act, they'd do, like, five minutes of stand-up. Yeah. Um, like, they, they, they would, the, the good ones would go on and do some more. Um, and I remember this night specifically because it was the Thursday before Good Friday. So no one was coming in to watch that show because everyone was getting pissed after work. Yeah. Um, no consequences. Um, and so he was like, well, just do, like, a minute or two at the start. A, a lot of the acts haven't shown up. Um, and my my friend, who's called Andy, came along, and I basically bullied him into going up and doing a minute because he's done like a bit of stand up. Yeah. So me being me, I'm very supportive of other acts. I laugh very loudly. Um, I'm very generous with my laughter because it's you know it's a nice thing to do, and you get more back from it. Yeah. Unfortunately, I was the only person doing that. So when I went up on stage, it sounded like no one was laughing at all. Um, so <laughs> like you were the audience. <laughs> Exactly, and yeah. so like Graham, who was hosting it, it was like in the uh, like, and here's the four acts having on this person, this person, this person, and uh, Andy as well. And I was like, Andy's not even a comedian, like, and he's going up on stage. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and he was like, you know, there's not a lot in. Should we get one more? On? Okay, let's get uh, James Benison on as well. And I was yeah. like, oh, oh, thank you. Yeah. You just announced to the entire room that I of the acts in the second half, I am the worst one. Yeah. And to make it even worse, he put me on at the end. So I was like, oh, great. So I'm like, I'm headlining technically. This is going to be diabolical. Um, so like the other acts, when they went up, though, their stuff wasn't really working, like the, the tried and tested material. Um, and like some other people have just then started to wander in who are a bit drunk. And, um, and so I got up to the stage and went, my material is not going to work. Like it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and I just was very self-aware about it. So I just started chatting to the people who had wandered in and ripping the shit out of them. Um, some random stuff happened and I just improvised and talked. And the room was in hysterics. Like it was the first time that they'd just lit up the entire yeah. night because they knew it was raw and fresh and was coming off out of my head for the first time. And I went, I, I think I'm onto something here. And I, I don't have the confidence to go on stage with no material for sure. Yeah. But. I have the confidence to go, this joke isn't working. I can riff for a bit until I get back onto it, like something else that I know will work. Um, it was just an eye opening night. Yeah, that's a real, like I've, I've never really done that. Like I've, 
I imagine that if if I did do that, if I had that sort of moment of realization that I could just think on my feet and and recover until I remember the rest of my material or or, or that sort of thing, it would be gigantic for me uh, because I I just I've never been that good at improvising or like crowd work or like if you see someone like Tanya Moore bouncing yeah. off people like this guy in the front row and then she goes over to this guy and like talks to him and then like two minutes later she's like referring back to this guy and there's callbacks and there's like her crowd work was funnier than my like best pre-rehearsed tried and tested material she's fucking epic uh and i see people like that and i'm like i could never fucking do that i mean i think it is a confidence thing but also it like the audience go easier on you i think when you're doing it because yeah. they know it's 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 no it's fresh that you it's it's about them and so they, they they like it it's about their mates that so they like it but also they know you're just coming up with it for the first time yeah. um and that's... if you're smart enough to be able to do callbacks to stuff then that, that that's an absolute killer yeah that's that's a big thing though is like the uh and again like anyone that's listening to this that isn't sort of in the know with comedy and stuff the the elephant in the room with a comedian, like if you've got a comedian on stage rehearsing, reciting something that they've clearly pre-written and uh, and performed like 500 times before, that like it might work if it's really well-written material, right? But I can guarantee it won't work as well as an MC who is thinking on their feet, bouncing off the crowd, getting the crowd involved. Yeah. And and it feels actually sort of like it's happening right here and now, like it's electric, it's sort of transactional. Yeah. It's um, there's real like comedic currency to it when it's happening, like in the room, like the the best. I know exactly what you mean. Like I, I the show that I won the award for, the superhero show. I remember doing it in Brighton, and the first weekend it was fresh and raw and got a great response. Second weekend I was still kind of tweaking it and changing bits around. Uh, again um had a great crowd third weekend it just went flat the whole weekend no no one yeah. was laughing as much at the bits that they used to and i was like why I don't, why is it and it's because i'd learned the script yeah so what i then realized was that in the fourth week uh, i managed to get it back and all i did was i acted like it was the first time i was ever saying it in my entire life yeah um and making it feel for the audience like this is something new for me and it's something new for you and this is a fresh thing that we experienced together and it just brought the, sh the show alive again um which is kind of ironic isn't it like you would think that if you come off like you've done this a few times then it would there'd be some sheen on it it would be like rehearsed it would be perfected and fine-tuned but actually it's almost the opposite it's like mm. if it feels a bit rough raw dangerous like it's not quite there yet then the audience like that it's like you're you're being a bit risky and you don't know if it's going to work, but let's, you know, let's see what happens. And yeah, it's, it's a, a straight, I think, I think it's less about, I think it's just a, the, the psychological nature of, of laughter. Like you laugh with your mates in the pub because you know that you're just coming up with it there and then. Yeah. That's an interesting thing. It's like when, when people say, Oh, you had to be there. Right. And I always yeah. think, no that's not true right it's it's all to do with like laying the groundwork and like context and like this stuff that my friends have said just like i'm sure there's things that your friends have said around the pub table where everyone's in hysterics it's a funny fucking thing that this guy just said to that guy but people say like oh well that would like you, like you might say to them oh you should try stand up you were really funny earlier on the table and they'll go like no nah, you know i'm funny in the pub funny but i'm not really funny on stage but actually i think you could translate that moment onto stage as long as you tell the, the like if you set the groundwork if you explain why this guy is being called that name or uh you know what happened before this conversation that uh allowed that joke to ferment in such a way that made it so yeah. funny you know no, I, I wholeheartedly agree. There's a, I mean, there's an art to writing and performing stand-up. Of course, of course there is. But like uh, so many of the very big comedians, a lot of the, I mean, I can think of four or five at the top of my head who tell stories about them at the pub with their yeah. mates, and so, a funny thing that happened. Like that, that is it's the same thing. It's just that they have not. It's not just a stream of consciousness. Like what an actual conversation is. It's a crafted story um, with a punchline at the end. And yeah, I think that's very much the difference. I mean, it's really a, a sort of they're the same product in my mind. It's like you've got 
this moment here is this guy talking to that guy in a sarcastic way or using some sort of funny metaphor and it's funny it elicits laughter then you've got this guy on a stage telling you about that moment where this guy said that to that guy and both of those products will elicit laughter they're just very slightly differently packaged in my mind absolutely um james thank you smash this everybody we've 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 run out of time mate uh, we've solved the comedy problem so it's fine we're good we have and and just like i said to you earlier like so again like for anyone listening uh i don't want to sort of pull up the curtain too much but usually when i, I book guests i sort of give them a couple of points that we might touch on and you know topics that we share an interest in and uh uh and once again james we've you know we've we've uh, uh defined the bullet points we were going to touch on and we've <laughs> we've barely fucking touched on any of it um but it's been really interesting stuff and uh it's been really great to catch up with you mate so um all the best uh with the conceptual show that i really hope that you do start work on sometime soon and thank you uh, yeah. Thank you for having me. yeah you're very welcome and uh, i'll catch up with you a bit for a beer at some point in london and yeah we'll on we'll the train there, bud. on the train yeah, yeah. if there's a train we'll themed pub in london we're there we'll, we'll just go on the circle line go round and round drinking <laughs> Don't I mean? Don't tempt me. That hopefully we'll bump into Diane Abbott as well. So, oh, what a party! Uh, cool. Thank you so much once again, James Bennett.